Welcome to my channel. Oops, maybe I should get the microphone closer. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, is it working? Yeah, the microphone's working, I guess. <clears throat> <sighs> my name's Stephen Anderson, and this is As I See It, which I think is a little more uh, to the point. How do I see things? Uh, because I'm not God. <sighs> but it is about thinking biblically. Um, and I want to do another video because I basically, it might be useful for some out there, uh, the, the trials and, you remember there was a, ancient movies, back in some of the earliest movies, there was like the trials and tribulations of Pauline or something. Uh, all these early silent films. But... <clears throat> Sometimes we go through things that are useful for others also, and the, the difficulty in, in finding a church. Because what's called a church today is not a church. You know, th this, uh, quickly, all churches should be community independent churches, independent as non-denominational, not associated with any denomination. Why? Because Christ isn't associated with any denomination. As soon as you become associated with a denomination and distinctives, you become a sect. And it's a club. It becomes a religious club that carries out the, uh, the purpose and the uh, standards of that sect. It has membership requirements that aren't identical with Christ's. So... <sighs> See, that, that's like the Roman Catholics. Uh, the, the Roman Church became a sect when it started saying, you must believe this and this and this, the Bible doesn't teach. You must submit to the authority of the Pope. You must, you must be in communion with the Pope. Nonsense. There's no way I'm going to be in communion with that man. No way. Assuming he's a man, which who knows today. Or what he'll be tomorrow. <laughs> you never know, especially with this guy. Uh, there I went. I, I, I used a gendered word, a guy. This person. Is that a, is that going to, wait, wait, how long until that becomes not permitted either? Because that sets you apart from like animals and inanimate things. And in the metaverse, it's all the same. This is a world, especially the West, on the, on a, on a, road race to, well, I'm going to say to insanity, but it's already there. We are in the last stage. We are in the last days. It's, it's insanity out there. When people are asserting things that, you know, that they assert things, I think it's just to offend God. When you say there's 150 genders, the Bible says in the beginning God created man and he made them male and female. That's it. Two, and the two shall become one. And what happens when that happens? You have children. <laughs> and that's part of God's purpose. And when you twist, see, a lot of times what we call, the, what the word is actually perversion because it, it means t a twisting. And when we twist what God has created for a different purpose, apart from the purposes of God, that is part of what sin is. We, we are living disordered lives. We're guilty of disordered conduct. Disorderliness, not being in accord with God's order. It might be a better understanding of what the word sin means. I'll know the word. Common word means to fall short, to miss the mark. And what's the mark? The glory of God, the sinless, uh, his, his perfection. We were created to be the image of God. So anything that is less than the image of God is missing the mark. And if you sit, tell me human beings today bear the image of God, I, I call BS on that. What? The moral image of God? The spiritual image of God? What? What do you mean by the image of God? Man was created to be that. God's purpose hasn't changed, and God is going to accomplish his purpose. But am I the image of God? Even as a born-again person, only in a sense... Only partially. And I want, that's what I want to talk about, uh, assuming that the ministry of truth doesn't squash it all. 
You never know. Uh, remember the Ministry of Truth from George Orwell's 1984? Now, that might be a, a forbidden reference now. I don't know either. Who knows? We don't know what the forbidden words are. It's sort of like uh, the, uh, the no-fly list. Nobody knows who's on it and what the requirements are to be not on it. It's a secret government list. Secret government anything. Just think about this for a second. In a democracy... Secrecy should be forbidden because if the people don't know what the government's doing, they have no control over it. It's not their government at all. So obviously in active military campaigns, there are certain things you might not want to disclose to the enemy. But when you've got secrecy in government outside of very limited areas like that, it is no longer democracy because the people don't know what the government's doing and when the government is deliberately lying and promoting on truths that should be an impeachable offense to lie to the people should be uh, sufficient to be impeached to deliberately deceive the people should be impeachable Otherwise, you can't have a democracy. I think in ancient Greece, that was actually considered a crime, too. I mean, the idea of doing things that, that undercuts that. Well, ancient Greece, you're talking about, let's see, which was a democracy, uh, not Corinth. Uh, Athens. Not Sparta, Athens. I mean, <laughs> which ancient Greece? That wasn't a country. It wasn't a unified country. Okay, so there's a bunch of city-states. Sparta and, and, uh, and Athens were not on the same page. So here, uh, nor was Corinth. So here we're, we've got, I don't want to mention, um, but I mean, it, it, uh, as far as uh, the Ministry of Truth. And what's, what social media has become over the last few years is, uh, uh, first of all, it, it went from a service a communications service and media to an advertising media that was their purpose, that was their their model of how to make revenue is to, to take your information, to gobble up all the details about you and use it for targeted advertising. That's their, their selling pitch. Two, of course, advertising is about uh, went from, in historically went from informing people about what was available to creating desires for things they didn't know they needed uh, and, and to uh, I guess the ultimate end of that is manipulation of people's thinking and beliefs and that's where it is now and it, it it's really uh, rather than a defenders of truth they be, they have become the suppressors of truth because what is the, the only thing that is t it's like what is kryptonite to Superman what is kryptonite to the lie? The truth. Truth is kryptonite to the lie. And the father of lies is Satan. So, And Satan controls, according to the Bible, Satan controls the systems and organizations and governments of, the, of this world because he controls the people. They're, they've given themselves over to him. <laughs> and he's a liar. <clears throat> and he uses lies. Uh, to manipulate people and look at what the government's doing today. Look at what the FBI and everybody else is doing. They're lying to manipulate people. And when you when you don't have access to the truth, you do not, a, a democracy is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. A republic is impossible. What you have is a, a rule by oligarchs that shape opinion to justify their actions. You're being manipulated. And uh, the, this huge corporation that has a nonsense name, think, think of the biggest communication uh, company that has gobbled up so much of this that has a name that, that is not even a word. Well, of course, them and uh, they and others sell their services to the government. When the government is engaged in contracting uh, human manipulation... <laughs> 
Th these things aren't ministers of truth. These organizations are the, uh, the, the protectors of the lie, protecting from truth. They suppress truth. They don't suppress, you see, uh, these, these outfits don't suppress all the lies that are out there on social media. Because things like Hollywood and, and much of advertising and much of politics are by nature lies. They're not truth at all. Much of society is by nature a lie. As, as Putin said, he was right, the, the, the whole thing is based on lies. Much of religion is lies. And the, uh, the, ministers of, the ministry of truth, as in George Orwell's ministry, was really charged with protecting the lies and suppressing truth. That's what we see today in the United States and in the West. And of course, Google and others are not national corporations at all. They're transnational monsters. Oh, well. But if you know God, you know the truth. And God is bigger than Google. And God will eliminate them. If they don't, they'll probably eliminate themselves long before that. But I'm going to uh, deal today with a particular lie that's in Christianity, in a segment of Christianity that I find very disturbing. And uh, although it's pretty much died out, it still has a residual, a shadow. And it is uh, a shadow that can damn you. So let's begin with another damnable lie that's common in Christ what's called Christianity. And I want to show you something. This has to do with the prosperity gospel, which is not what I want to deal with. But uh, where do they get their authority for promising, uh, for making the claim that God wants everyone to be rich and healthy? And, of course, these people. Now, these people get their doctrines from one another. They don't actually get this from the Bible. They just get it from one another. They find out somebody else is successful and prosperous, and he's got a rich ministry, so they copy him. Think about Christianity in general today. Why do they have? Why does it look like a a nightclub act from Las Vegas so often, from the '60s? You know, you got a bunch of women up there with microphones swaying around and and wearing, well, holy jeans, <laughs> revealing garments, but not quite revealing the. You know, why do women wear jeans that are shredded? they got to show flesh one way or another, I guess. I, ladies, it doesn't make you look attractive, by the way. It makes you look poor. Oh, I don't. I know. It's social peer pressure. When I was in junior high, I mean, if you, if you wore white socks rather than something else, you were considered a nerd or whatever. You know, it's the same kind of nonsense you go through in school. You're supposed to grow out of that stuff. That's one of the, the, the privileges of being older. You don't really care anymore. You realize all this is nonsense, and why do I care what somebody else thinks about me? I don't need to worry about that. I'm concerned about what you think about God. Because that is not self-centered concern. It's, it, it's love. So here, let's, first of all, let's deal with, this, with the prosperity gospel. So what is the scriptural basis for the prosperity gospel? Well, let's take a look. This is what they quote all the time. Now, this is 3 John, a, a letter to a particular individual. And this is why some of this, like Third John, was a little slow as being uh, accepted as part of the canon, simply because it was written. The law was written by an apostle, which is typically one of the, the requirements. It was written to an individual, as, as opposed to general teaching. So to uh, the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Now, that's it right there. Verse 2, I, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So the prosperity teachers 
take this as a general promise from God to everybody in all circumstances, whether you're saved or not, this is God's desire for you. This is his only desire for you, particularly. But this is their thing. This is their shtick that they use to sell their snake oil. And that's what it is. It's snake oil. See, snake oil was a fictitious drug that had who knows what for ingredients that they promised to heal all kinds of things that it wouldn't heal. Probably was somewhat effective because of the placebo effect, but because people believed it worked, therefore sometimes it has a... Actually, as I've said before, if you look in the physician's desk reference, the PDR, the, 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 the manufacturers have all their, you know, their research data and everything else on the particular drugs including effectiveness, and they'll compare it, you know, a double-blind study against a placebo, a sugar pill. And in other words, an inner thing, So, and they're double-blind, so you don't know whether you're taking the real thing or the, the fake thing to try to eliminate the placebo effect. But the one thing I've noticed is that the placebo effect often is not that far removed from the effect of the drug itself. The drug is only somewhat more effective than a placebo. Well, then why not just take a placebo? They're much cheaper. In other words, we're being ripped off by these pharmaceutical companies. If a placebo is 60% effective and a drug is, say, 68% effective, the heck with the drug. Save your money. Take a placebo. It'll probably work just as well. I don't want to make that as a universal application, but, I mean, look. Look at the data before you take a medicine. Check it out. Look at the manufacturer, the, the actual data about its effectiveness compared to a placebo. And then see if you want to say, it's like or an anti, I say a cancer, you know, chemotherapy. Look at the case outcomes. What is your chance of survival taking it versus not taking it? Is it really effective, or are you being sold a pig in a poke? How old are you? How long do you want to live in this corrupt world? Who do you trust more, the drug companies or God? Well, I'll tell you who I trust more is God. If God can't heal you, well, either he doesn't want to or... Well, he's not able to. Now, here are the prosperity teachers. Now, you can look at the long history of this. You can look up, look up the history of Zion, Illinois, which was a cult, a religious cult following center, a commune, basically, of a guy devoted to, he claimed to be the second coming of Elijah. Zion, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. On the north side, quite a ways up. Anyway, <clears throat> here this is a personal letter, and it's a greeting to Gaius, and he says, Beloved, John is writing to Gaius, and I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. Now, to prosper means to be successful. That's what the word means. Now, Gaius was a Christian who was serving the Lord. And John says, I'll, I pray, I desire this. Now, does it say God promises you this? No, not at all. So if you take a verse out of context like this and build an entire ministry on it, you're a fraud. You're selling snake oil. You have to look at, uh, at what the Scripture teaches about all things. Now, it can make you filthy, filthy, stinking rich like Joel Osteen, but Joel Osteen sells snake oil. You can get prosperous. You can be rich selling snake oil. But then you've got to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Decide. <laughs> do you want to sell snake oil and get judged, or do you want to follow Christ? You're not. This isn't the gospel. This is not a promise to you. It's a desire that John ex uh, expresses. It's not even a promise of God to Gaius. Is John saying, I hope, I desire that you may prosper in all things and be in health. 
Well, don't we desire that for everything? Everybody, really? I mean, in a way, we don't want them sick. We don't want them in poverty without food and clothing. Do we want them living in a mansion like Joel Osteen? No, not if we love them. <laughs> or or uh, Donald Trump? Ugh. Gaudiness. I don't know. I don't think much of Donald Trump's style. I think it's a little bit over the top. Anyway, uh, Donald Trump's a little bit over the top, but then you've got people like Joe Biden... Ugh. See this this is an example of of snake oil religion. This is not God's promise to you at all. In no way is this a promise of God to you. This is a desire that John expresses as a greeting to a to someone he knows, to someone he loves. Yeah, he doesn't want them to be sick and and, and bad and and poverty because they're servants of God. Okay, so, and, and in general, Jesus, now you could say that Jesus talked about this. He says, don't be concerned about tomorrow. God knows what you need. God will take care of you. Be content with your needs. We don't have to be content with poverty. We don't have to be content with it, having nothing. We're not just deliberately supposed to, to avoid everything. That's, that's self-righteousness. But we need to... Be careful to not allow the sellers of snake oil. See, their their purpose is not us, our relationship with God. Their purpose is to separate us from our money, to get our money in their pockets. That's <clears throat> that's why they they always teach the the seed faith principle. That uh, oh yeah, give to me, and God will reward you for it. Oh yes, that that's a guaranteed. Uh, that that should tell you right there. But there's enough people that, you know, there's a sucker born every day, and people in their selfishness and their desire, their self-centeredness, will you know the flesh tends to fall for this stuff. So what I really want to talk about today is another spiritual lie, and it's entire sanctification or sinless perfectionism. Uh, typically followed by the followers of John Wesley, Wesleyanism. And now the Methodists long ago abandoned that and Wesley and everything else. So today Methodism is, well, dead religion. Liberalism, dead religion, religion without God. That's what it is. The God of the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church, is not the God of the Bible because they don't care what the God of the Bible thinks. That's why they often have rainbow flags in front of their church. See, they don't love either. It's like homosexuals. See, I'm going to try to get myself banned from YouTube or something here. No, if you love them, you want to see them restored, especially to a proper relationship with God, which means also a proper... If you're not in a, in a proper relationship with God, you won't be in a proper relationship with God's creation either, and that's the situation there. See, what, what their lifestyles are a manifestation of being out of that relationship with God and, you know, serving and worshiping other things like sexual pleasure. It's just all, these are all manifestations. Now, there's, there's really no difference between that and, say, the people on Wall Street that live to make money. Unrestrained capitalism is just as bad. It's, it's an abomination in the sight of God because it's idolatry. All forms of idolatry are abominable with God. Substituting something for God in your life. Making something else be your God or take God's place. Living for something other than God is an abomination because that's not, it's utterly contrary to God's purpose in creating human beings. We are created for God to be his image in creation and to be in dominion over creation. Dominion 
as God's agents and God's presence and God's image. And everything that, that see, that's the mark when, when Paul writes in, what is it, uh, uh, third chapter of Romans, he said that all have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the, the word sin there is to mean to miss the mark. Well, what is the mark? It's God's intended purpose for man, for humanity, to be his image on earth. And in order to, to fulfill that, we have to be in harmony with God. We're not. Now, <clears throat> some people seem to get a little ahead of themselves. So, uh, the under John Wesley, John Wesley and his followers. Now, John Wesley is not entirely responsible for this on his own. Taught the doctrine of entire sanctification and sinless perfectionism as a second work of grace. And you wonder where the, the Pentecostalism and their second work of grace come from and all this stuff. Goes, sometimes there's a third work of grace. Depending on the This call goes back to Wesley. This was unknown. This was unknown in Christianity before John Wesley's time, as far as I can tell. And Wesley himself taught, if it's new, it's not true. In other words, if it's not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints in the first century by the apostles, it's not true. If it's added, it's not true. Dispensationalism is not true because it's not part of the faith revealed in the Scripture. Sinless perfectionism or entire sanctification or a second blessing or, or something subsequent, a subsequent work of grace after salvation is not true because it's not taught in the Scriptures. Now, Wesley, he was an Anglican, always remained an Anglican. An Anglican. He believed that infant baptism regenerates you, but he believes that your regeneration can be lost. You got to get saved, and they got to get lost. They get saved and lost, and saved and lost. There was a theme in the the movie. What was the name of that movie? Uh, I can't remember it. That's all right. Don't need to get into that probably. Lancaster, I think it was the one that starred in that, had to do with revivalism. Particularly, the scene I remember, though, there was, yeah, talking about getting saved and getting lost. And it was, that movie was about the same kind of holiness preaching, that the revivalism, uh, Finney, and... Well, actually, Wesley, too. The, the first great revival and the second revi great revival, I don't think were revivals at all. Not revivals of biblical Christianity, at least. I don't believe in revivalism. The Bible doesn't teach it. But what is the biblical basis for the claim of entire sanctification or the eradication of the sinful nature? The eradication of the flesh? Wait a minute. This is flesh. This is flesh. I'm not a spirit being. I don't have a spiritual body. This is still flesh. This is the body that comes from Adam. So their main argument, so, so I went to the expense of getting this book. This is the, the fundamental theological textbook for the, the holiness movement as a whole. J. Greider, uh, Kenneth Greider and... So I wanted to say, okay, is there a biblical basis that I've somehow missed to the second work of grace and the sinless perfectionism and the tyrant sanctification, whatever term you want to use for it? Again, the Pentecostal movement and the, um, the charismatic movement are, are spinoffs of this all. All goes back to Wesley. Second work of grace. You know, you get saved and then you got to get something else. And if you know anything about Wesley's life, he was a mess. Who knows whether he was saved or lost? And when? Because he had four sources of authority. 
The Bible, okay, that's a good one. Tradition, bad one. How do you know tradition's correct? If it wasn't part of what was delivered by the, the apostles, it's false. It's been added. It's been added. Wesley himself said, if it's new, it's not true. Well, tradition arose after the first century. So anything that arose after the first century, after the apostles, outside of the apostles' teaching, is false. Unless it's just repeating what they said. So you have the Bible, tradition, reason. So you're sinful. So you don't believe that your, your reasoning is affected by your sinful nature? The desires of your heart don't affect your reasoning? Of course they do. It's one of the reasons why philosophy died. Because your heart affects, you justify what you want with your reasoning. <sighs> your mind isn't sinless. Four, experience. How do you know how to interpret your experience? You don't. Apart from the scripture, apart from God's revelation, you don't know why things happen. It's only your own opinion. So you had something that happened to you, and you interpret it, but is that interpretation correct? Well, if it's not according to the Scripture, then very well may not be. I mean, all kinds of people have all kinds of spiritual experiences. The new, What used to be called the New Age movement, and of course now we don't have the New Age so much as blatant Satanism becoming very popular. Paganism. I mean, there, there's experiences. You can have all kinds of experiences. The Native Americans uh, used to go on uh, vision uh, quests and things like that, depending on what depends on the tribe. But, uh, so they would have an experience, and they discover their power animal. They look for a vision where the, the, uh, the spirits would guide them. But that's so. That doesn't. That's not truth. We have to realize that there's there's all kinds of lying spirits out there. They're not all spirits aren't from God. If they're from God, they're not going out doing their own thing deceiving people. So what what was the, uh, according to Grider, you'd think this is about the only, this is what's used in their Bible colleges and seminaries, Grider's textbook here. Now, you'd think you'd find a solid biblical basis for holiness theology if the Bible really teaches it. Of course, if you're a follower of Wesley, he doesn't have to be in the Bible, really. So it seems to me here, from what I've seen, that the basic argument for entire sanctification or sinless perfectionism, although Wesley was a little, tended to distance himself a little bit from that term, but Wesley's definition of sin was only willful, deliberate, conscious uh, action, disobedience. When you were in total control of yourself and you chose freely, in the true sense of the word, to sin. It's sort of like the Roman Catholic idea of mortal sin, which is almost impossible to do. <laughs> Because if you're an unregenerate sinner, you're not in control of your actions. Anyway, you're not free. You're a slave to sin. And if you're a born-again Christian, you're not totally necessarily, you're not supposed to be a slave to sin, but, but still you've, you're, you're dwelling in a body of flesh. You're not totally free of, of the influence of the flesh and the world and the devil. You can sin. So, but anyway, here, Greider seems to put a lot of emphasis on 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So let's take a look at that. Okay, what should I take it from? Uh, oh, they love the NIV. They love the NIV. So we'll use that one. May God himself, there's a word that, now the NLT leaves the word himself out. That's a corruption. Uh, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Well, actually, it doesn't say that, but it says entirely. Uh, but Grider likes through and through. He especially likes the NIV here. May your, your whole spirit, 
soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. So this is, this is teaching entire sanctification. Sanctify you entirely, completely. Let's see, uh, King James, sanctify you wholly. New King James, sanctify you completely. NAS, sanctify you entirely. ESV, sanctify you completely. The NLT says, make you holy in every way. Okay, so when? They ignore that. They ignore, they ignore the question. They ignore the end of the verse. Maybe it's because it's on to, in the King James, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the King James was the version they all used when the holiness movement and stuff came about. The, Wesley, the version Wesley used, the version the founders of the Nazarenes used, all the King James. On to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means I should look that up. Uh, In the Parousia. Uh, yeah, that's why the others say at the coming of. On to the coming of? I don't think so. Um, that might have caused part of the problem. Because that would say, uh, let me check something else here. Okay, here, first of all, make you, sanctify you, or make you holy. It is uh, in the, the verb is in the optative aorist sense, which indicates, I've, I've had to look this up, by the way. So, yes, I have to look up uh, in the book uh, Beyond, um, Greek Beyond the Basics or something like that. Uh <clears throat> because it's a complicated language. It, optative, it means it's something that's possible, but not certain. But there's something even more obvious here that doesn't involve the Greek. And somebody say, amen. What does it say? Let's see. Let's go up here. Let, let me use let me use the new King James because that's the King James updated. Blameless, preserved. Well, first of your may your your whole spirit, soul, and body. See, they just look at the first clause. May the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. They ignore the rest. What does the rest say? May your whole spirit, soul, and body. Now, this is Thessalonians. What does Paul talk about in 1 Thessalonians? The coming of the Lord Jesus, the resurrection and the rapture. Be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're still alive at his coming. He's hoping, he's saying, I pray to, he's pr pr saying, Gaius, I hope, uh, this isn't Gaius, excuse me, but the, the, the Thessalonians, I hope that, that you're preserved unto the coming of the Lord Jesus at his return. It doesn't say that you may live a sinless, perfect life today. It says, I hope that you remain in Christ at his coming that you're trusting in faith in Christ. Because that's the only blameless listen you're going to have. If it is your sinless perfection, you're not. You don't have sinless perfection. Okay, and we're going to go over another text. See, this is their text. They ignore there's a time on the verse, and that's at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Christ uh, appears, what will happen? As he writes in this very book, the dead in Christ will be raised, 
And we who are alive and left will be caught up to meet in the Lord in the air, and we will all be transformed in the inst in a twinkling of the eye. We will be transformed without dying, uh, and conformed to the image of Christ. That is when we become blameless in all aspects. When we when we truly are sanctified entirely, is at His return. When we literally, physically, spiritually become his image in all ways, as not corrupted by the flesh. Our bodies are transformed into a spiritual body, and we are conformed to the image of Christ at his return. Oh, they didn't see that part. They don't want to see that part. They want to try to justify their doctrine. Wesley's doctrine. And the Nazarene movement in particular, the holiness movement that arose in the late 19th and early 20th century, 20th century was a rejection of the apostasy that was occurring in the, in the Methodists, or what they called apostasy, to go back to, because the, the Methodists were, were diminishing the importance of this uh, sinless perfectionism and entire sanctification. Why? Perhaps because it's not biblical? Okay, but, but Greider uses another verse. He also refers, uh, he says, uh, but while the NIV rendering of 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I don't think the NIV is to be trusted, is excellent. The NSB at 1 Thessalonians 3.13 is preferable. So in Greider's opinion, see, this is a typical uh, Nazarene proof text for sinless perfectionism or entire sanctification. But they also use uh, uh, here this verse in 1 Thessalonians, same book, chapter 3, so he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Again, what do we find <clears throat> the foremost thing in, in 1 Thessalonians? The return of the Lord Jesus. The doctrine of <clears throat> that, that we shall not all die, but what's called the rapture. Not This doesn't refer to a secret seven year before the tribulation rapture necessarily. That's just not taught in the scripture. If you want to, uh, to speculate as a, as a possibility, well, okay, but it's just speculation. So the, to establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Well, to be blameless in holiness, how are you blameless in holiness? Imputed righteousness before God and Father, our God and Father, at the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. doesn't say now. It says at his return, because we who are trusting in God, who are trusting, looking forward to his return, when he returns, the saints who are alive and haven't died yet will be transformed in an instant. And those who are dead in Christ will receive a new body that is conformed to the image of Christ, not this body of flesh. See, there's a time. They just ignore that. They ignore at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So you can't expect to have <clears throat> this sinless perfectionism or the entire sanctification until then, because you still have, you live in a body of flesh, and still sin dwells in your flesh. Now, Nazarene Doctrine says, talks about the entire eradication of the flesh. Well, then you're dead. You don't have a body anymore because this body comes from Adam. It doesn't come from Christ. Isn't that true or not? See, this is nonsense. This is theological snake oil. Just like Kenneth Copeland, they are misusing the scriptures, taking things out of context, ignoring the, context, the verse itself. They ignore half the verse in both cases which clearly indicates this takes place at the coming of the Lord Jesus in order to justify an unbiblical doctrine. 
And apparently congregations don't notice. They don't notice. Where are the people that say, wait a minute. This verse does not say what you're saying. See, people don't want to challenge the pastor. Even if they personally say, yeah, I don't know. They don't want to say anything. Isn't that not true? So what does the Scripture say about sinless perfection or entire sanctification? Does the Scripture talk about this? See, if you've got an idea for a doctrine, and you think, I think the Scripture teaches this. Well, is there any place the Scripture denies what you're trying to assert? That just assumes you actually know the Bible a bit. Well, yeah, there is. Like uh, 1 John... <laughs> 1 John chapter uh, 1, right there in the beginning of this book that talks about, you know, how do you know that you're really a Christian? That you're sinlessly perfect? No. Although John says, uh, I write these things so that you may not sin. They mention that one. If anyone sins, we have an... Say, of course we don't want people to sin. We don't want to sin. Do we do it? Yes, we do. As John acknowledges in chapter 1 here, he says this, starting at verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So if you want to confess your uh, perfect sinful sinlessness, you make Jesus out to be a liar. See, you're trying to stand on your own righteousness. You believe that you are in a better state with God because you claim to be sinlessly perfect rather than those that trust on, in God, in Christ, to be, for him to be the satisfaction for your sins. You're dishonoring Christ in the cross. And you're believing theological snake oil. And pretty much, I think, the, the, the holiness movement has abandoned this stuff because it's simply unbiblical. I don't know if that's why they've abandoned it. Uh, I wish they'd abandoned people like Greider. But, <laughs> but I'm not going to hold my breath. It's like, you know... Listening to people preach tithing when Paul is so explicit. The New Testament, you, all you have to do is look in the New Testament. Does it teach this? Did Jesus and the apostles teach that believers under the New Covenant are required to tithe? And is the church the administrative structure and the building the storehouse is mentioned in ba Malachi anyway. And th not only that, and you can tell I've looked at this many years ago, go back to Malachi and to the law and find out what the tithe is for and who's it supposed to go to and for what purpose. And I'll guarantee that will never be preached in a Nazarene church. There's a pastor over at the little one I attend at least at the moment. I'm debating that. Depends. What does he believe about imputed righteousness? Is he so far removed from the gospel that there's no place for me there? I've already decided I can't promote that church. But uh, he denies imputed righteousness. Wesley pretty much did. Uh-uh. Then it's about your works and your righteousness and not Christ's. 
think Wesley held to imparted righteousness? See, Luther overemphasized justification. See, justification is the foundation of salvation. You can't build on salvation other than on justification. It has to be erected on Christ's atonement. As Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Christ crucified. So you can't even begin to talk about sanctification and the, 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 coming, the gift of the Holy Spirit and all these other things until your sinfulness and your guilt before God have been dealt with. And if you're, you're preaching that your deeds, your works, your obedience is the basis for your relationship with God, then you're finished. Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. You're an enemy of Christ. You think, I don't need Christ. It's my righteousness, my obedience. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. It's a deception. Entire sanctification, as we've seen, it's at the time when Christ returns, when he transforms us by his power. The stuff that's been sold in the holiness movements is theological snake oil. It is no different from the doctrine of Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland, the health and wealth gospel. It's as much a corruption as that. It just took a little longer to be able to sell that snake oil. People had become more biblically ignorant to sell that snake oil. But they were pretty big biblically ignorant under the holiness movement anyway. Because it's a movement, you know, gave people excited. There's all this doctrine we discovered in the Bible. And they have an experience. You have testimonials. I experienced this. Like, testimonials not worth nothing. Because you can find testimonials anywhere. The Muslims have them. The, Mo the Mormons have them. And the spades. Jehovah's Witnesses have them. All these things. The secular world has ex uh, testimonials. Oh, I bought this miracle engine rebuilding tablet that I saw advertised in the back page of the Milwaukee Journal when I was growing up. <laughs> and my engine is still going. After 150,000 miles, cars back then didn't last as long. Doesn't prove anything. You only report the good results. You never report the bad results. That's why in science they try to do things like double blind studies to eliminate that. That's not evidence. Reports of miracles aren't evidence. Miracles that do not bear witness to the gospel as recorded in Jesus in, in, in the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ, are false miracles. Oh, I did this and I did that and I got healed. So, what did it mean to be healed either? I've, I mean, I've seen such nonsense among Christians claiming to be healed when it was manifest they weren't. But that was the name and the claim, and it's your faith. You have to hold to your belief that you are healed even when the evidence denies it. That has nothing to do with Jesus Christ at all. And the holiness movement, I fear that there are people, to the degree this is still going on, are living lies. They know they are not sinless. Fortunately, it's been de-emphasized. They know they're not sinless. They know Wesley, I mean, if you read the Bible, you know Wesley's definition of sin is absolute bunk. Absolute bunk. Sin is missing the mark, the standard of God's perfection. 
the standard of being God's image. Don't believe these people. Believe God's word. Don't fall for theological snake oil. Read the verse. Read the context. See what is being taught there. And if they're not teaching what the context says, dismiss them as being legitimate teachers. Because they're not. They are deceivers. They are using the Bible to promote, to promote themselves. Just like Rick Warren used the Bible in the Purpose Driven Life to promote Rick Warren's ideas. He needed something to establish what he was saying as some sort of authority, so he would just randomly quote, well, there, he'd find some version of the Bible, no matter how absurd, like the Message Bible, find something that said something in a out of context, what he wanted to say, and he'd use that. That man is an enemy of the Scripture. Twisting God's words for his own personal purposes and gain. That's what people do. That's what sinful people do. Because they're self-centered instead of God-centered. They haven't submitted themselves to God, to his righteousness. See, that's what the holiness movement is, I think. Again, I wasn't raised. Of course, if I was raised in it, I'd probably be blinded by it. Of course, I was raised as a Lutheran. I gave that up to it. If I, if, you know, if I left the, the religion I was raised in, why should I hold to something else that's nonsense? This is nonsense. This kind of stuff is nonsense. I think one of the things I historically have had some attraction to the Nazarenes is because they they don't believe in an empty salvation. They don't believe in in uh, um, easy believism, where because you believed a fact about Jesus, but you still continue to live your life just as you always have, that you're still saved. Well, the Bible doesn't agree with that. If you live a, no, we're talking about a manifestly sinful lifestyle. Like a thief. A person that has a lifestyle is a thief. There are people like that. That's their lifestyle, being a thief. That's their profession, being a thief. Yeah. <laughs> Weird as it might seem for a Christian, there are, that's what they do. Just like drug peddlers and everything else. So, a drug dealer. I mean, so, so somebody that's a drug dealer, they, they, cl they claim to come to Christ. But they continue to deal drugs. I mean, you've got to give them a little time here, you know. But, but I mean, say a year later, they're still out in the street think, dealing drugs, and they don't think anything of it. It has nothing to do with my relationship with Christ. I mean, pro prostitutes. Man, man, I know about this. Okay. Uh, you, you know, you, you can prostitute. I remember one uh, older woman that called me on the phone. She said, can you help me? I need money for my rent. <laughs> Why? Because... Because her roommate had taken all her her drugs and used them for herself. There's selfishness. Here you have one drug addict prostitute complaining about another drug using prostitute because the other drug using prostitute has had selfishly used all the heroin, I think it was heroin, on herself. <laughs> What else is and the other one's complaining about it? Hey, you don't leave me for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, selfishness. That's see, it's, it's all that sin tends to be self-centeredness. That seems to be the universal element in all sin. But instead of God-centeredness. But remember, one she, she one time she called and she was asking for money to make her rent payment, so she didn't get kicked out. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, I think, I think I said something. You don't need your rent money. You need a, a, a relationship with Jesus Christ or with God. And she, her, she was just irate, probably because she didn't get what she wanted. But she was irate. She said, I have a perfectly good relationship with God. I'm a Roman Catholic. 
Okay. I said, no, you don't. You're a drug addict and a prostitute. You don't have a good relationship with God. Implying, of course, that being a drug addict and a prostitute is not a, rela a good relationship with God. She took offense at that. I don't know, apparently the Roman Catholic Church that she went to, supposedly, didn't have a problem with that. Now, I, I suspect, I, I don't know if she's really Roman, she might have been born as Roman Catholic and baptized, you know, because I suspect even a Roman Catholic Church might not permit you to take communion without confession if you're a prostitute and a drug addict. And they may give you the idea that you actually have to stop being a prostitute and a, uh, and a drug addict to have a good relationship with God. I don't think they're, uh, you know, uh, maybe Pope Francis is different, but. <sighs> How did I get on that? I don't know. But the, the, the oh, I know, uh, the, the Nazarenes having an idea of effectual salvation. And I think uh, when I had my, my uh, Calvinist period, before I discovered the depths of Calvinism, you know, part of the attractiveness to it, having been to ex exposed to so much of the easy believism, um, which isn't the best term, the, the empty salvationism uh, of, of evangelicalism today, now, when I was saved, that wasn't a thing. It was not a thing. It wasn't this empty, uh, uh, empty grace, ineffective grace. It was just a transaction in heaven. That's not what I saw. I saw young people who were into drugs and into other things, or just into themselves, radically transformed by the grace of God. Not that they were sinlessly perfect, but they had a relationship, a living relationship with Jesus Christ, where now God was central to their identity. He was central to their life. They had a life other than that, but I mean, God is the center of their life in, a, in most ways. Uh, that was, that was, you didn't see this. Now, there was some frauds, like Lonnie Frisbee, uh, who was one of the leaders of it, that had, was living a secret life as a homosexual and a, an alcoholic and maybe a drug user at the same time. I mean, some of these hippies, uh, the, I wasn't a hippie, but, uh, I mean, this is like this movement started. It just happened that a lot of young people were being saved. I mean, the, they had had questions about life. And certainly they weren't satisfied with their parents' materialism. Our parents came out of the Great Depression in World War II, and they were deprived in both of material possessions and when pro relative prosperity came along, and not like yours today, but, you know, and they actually could buy a car and maybe buy a little house on a mortgage. Uh, they had what their parents didn't have. My grandfather didn't own a house until I think my, my dad probably had bought a house before my grandparents did. One of them. I mean, they during World War II and before that, they lived in rental houses, both grandparents. They worked at General Motors and worked at and uh, lived in rental property until after the war and I don't know when was that probably one my mother's father probably was the first he built a little house I think the other one finally bought one small house and but the my our parents my parents grew up in that where they didn't own anything you know, rental property, uh, during the Depression, lack of stuff. During the war, lack of stuff. You were on rations, ration coupons. And then all of a sudden after that, relative prosperity and widespread, and they wanted their kids to grow up with everything they didn't have. But the problem was not the lack of material possessions, but the lack of a relationship with God.
the spiritual foundation for life. And the materialism that can be emphasized after the war. Not that it wasn't back in the 20s. <laughs> Certainly there was a time of, uh, before the Depression, was the, the, the roaring 20s with the time of utter materialism and debauchery and everything else. But uh, the, the, those that grew up with all these things, with the houses, never going hungry, always having clothes and shoes, even though with a large family that they might be a little bit, <clears throat> not the latest stuff, but um, might get a used bike that your father repainted rather than a brand new one. You're going to outgrow it anyway, why not? Parents usually drove used cars rather than new ones. But uh, the materialism didn't satisfy, didn't answer the basic questions of life. Of course it didn't answer the basic questions of life. Because life is not based on what possessions you have. Strange how Jesus is always right. The Bible is always correct. So there was young people uh, growing up in relative prosperity said, is this all life is? Getting a house and a job, having three kids, getting a new car. Is this what life is about? Not just in America either, Europe and other places. And so there was this, and God said no. And there was this revival, part of it was real, among young people much of it was real, that realized, no, there's, and they had, a, they had an encounter with Jesus Christ through faith in the gospel. And Christ became the center of their lives rather than this abstract thing that you were told to believe in. They knew him. They came to know Christ personally. But the fact that we had this encounter with God is not the basis of our salvation. It's what God did on the cross in Christ. If, if, if it wasn't for what Christ did on the cross, any kind of an encounter with God would have been in an incendiary variety, like lethal, because God is holy. but not today in evangelicalism. And even the Nazarenes are no longer about holiness. They're all, now they've all gone Rick Warren-esque, you know, trying to attract the world by becoming more like the world, making the churches look like, making the churches look like non-churches. Changing the name. No, that's not entirely bad. I mean, one of the large local churches here was uh, Southside Nazarene. Uh, now it's called uh, Tilton uh, Community, Grace Community Church. Good name. If they were really a community church and they really preached the gospel. But they don't. I think every church should be a community church, not a sect not a club, having exactly the same membership requirements as the Bible lays out. Doesn't go beyond Scripture. Doesn't diminish Scripture. Understands the New Covenant. Understands the church is God's people. And seeks to be a place where God's people can gather for communal worship and edification and nothing else. Not promoting of sectarian doctrines or causes or movements. But they also have to be faithful to preach the gospel according to the scriptures. Show me a church like that. I want a church like that. A New Testament church. 
It doesn't add requirements. and doesn't take away the requirements the Bible lays out properly understood in the New T Covenant. There aren't any around here that I know of. I can't find them. And certainly, you know, when you have an entire book of rules that supplements the Bible, you'll have it out here. I don't know. There's so many, so many denominations do that. Actually, the, the Lutherans have a bigger book, but the Nazarenes have their version of the Methodist handbook, which is filled with all kinds of do not do this and things, you know, like, uh, it used to be women were not even allowed to have a gold wedding ring because the scripture says women don't adorn yourself with gold and pleating of the hair and all these things, but adorn yourself uh, in your heart. Well, they take that as an absolute commandment. That's absurd. That's not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about let, let, the, let your adornment be inward. Not like society of that day as in today, outward. You know, like like the, the, the some of the different communities where the, you have all this gold bling, like really. And uh, uh, women, you know, the, well, you know what I'm talking about. The people that that it's all about their outward appearance. Paul said that's not what's important. It's your inward appearance. Your godliness, how much are you like Christ? Adorn yourself in your heart with the grace of God. Because that's lasting beauty, unlike the outward stuff, which only lasts a few years, if you ever have it. You know, the society presents these flawless, perfect images of people. They're not really like that. Back in the old days, it's, uh, you know, the magazines like Playboy, they'd have these uh, women that were thoroughly airbrushed. They weren't real. They were fake. They, they were flawless. Uh, not really. And the fact that they would pose naked for Playboy gener generally indicates they're probably someone you wouldn't want to marry anyway. Isn't that true? You would really want to marry a Playboy bunny or a model? Well, Donald Trump did. Not a bunny, I don't think. Although I do think, well, I don't want to get into that. not about her or Donald but Christ and following him and knowing what the gospel is because if you don't have the gospel you got nothing as I mentioned before if you don't have Christ in uh, imputed righteousness you don't have anything because you're not perfect But the great thing about Christ's imputed righteousness, one of the great things, is you don't have to be perfect because your relationship, your acceptance before God does not depend on you, but on Christ alone. And if you lose track of that and start thinking it depends on you because you've been good, you do this, you do that, you don't do this and you don't do that, You might have forfeited Christ, as Paul said, that if you're trying to be righteous through keeping a commandment, like in that case circumcision in the book of Colossians, you have severed yourself from Christ. It's pretty graphic uh, illustration there because basically saying, since you severed your foreskin, you severed Christ. You not only cut that off, you cut Christ off by trying to keep commandments that can never make you perfect 
because you don't even understand the purpose of the law, which is to condemn you, to show you your need, not to supply your need. Don't fall for snake oil. Trust in what God says, teaches in the New Testament because Christian, we're not under the law. And if you think that is heresy, well, you just don't understand the gospel.